The pursuit of the American dream draws many from far and wide. For Xu Ming Tang, it was a chance to give his family a better life. However, that dream was snuffed out on the afternoon of April 26, 1993. Tang, a husband, father, and well-liked member of the San Carlos community, emigrated from Taiwan to California. A businessman at heart, Tang opened up a little mom-and-pop corner shop called the Devonshire Little Store. It was a hit with the community, and Tang was a welcoming and friendly store owner. The little shop thrived as the community grew to know and like the owner Tang. In a way, the corner shop that had always been a fixture in that part of town took on a new personality under the ownership of Tang, and it shocked the community when they learned that Tang had been shot and killed in the very store he'd owned. On the afternoon of April 26, 1993, San Carlos police officers responded to a 911 call for a possible shooting. Upon arrival minutes after the incident, officers found Tang, the store owner, bleeding out after sustaining a single gunshot wound. Emergency medical personnel rushed Tang to a nearby hospital. He, however, succumbed to his injuries soon after arriving at hospital. In the meantime, investigators were collecting information as eyewitnesses came forward to report that an adult female was seen fleeing the store soon after the shooting. She was described to be in her 20s, with shoulder-length brown hair. The car she was driving was a 70s blue station wagon. Allegedly, Tang had been alone in the store when the incident occurred. Investigators maintained that the shooting was the result of a robbery gone wrong and were pursuing leads regarding the woman seen leaving the crime scene. The case received national attention and featured on America's Most Wanted. Although much attention was garnered by the crime, leads dried up for investigators. A reopening of the case in 2010 brought nothing new to the table. Eight years later, in 2018, it was an utter stroke of luck that brought the killer to justice. Oklahoma authorities were investigating an unrelated crime and stumbled upon a diary in a rural home in the town of Dewey, north of Tulsa. There they found a private journal titled, Things I Regret. In it was an account of the slaying of a Korean man during a robbery in San Carlos in 1993. The owner of the diary, 61-year-old Rain Hoffman Ramos. She had been living in the rural house when police conducted the search. Another search was conducted at a residence in Sacramento by California officials on March 16, 2022. The searches, which were conducted simultaneously between California and Oklahoma, yielded supporting evidence against Hoffman Ramos. Records show that Hoffman Ramos was a repeat offender that had been arrested multiple times on drug-related and other non-violent offenses. She was arrested and detained in Oklahoma, awaiting extradition to California. Although the diary mentions a Korean man, Tang was Taiwanese. The details matched the scenario that the investigators developed of the crime. Hoffman Ramos waived her rights to an extradition hearing and was brought back from Oklahoma to California where she made a brief appearance in San Mateo County Court on April 13, 2022. She was arraigned in court on April 26, 2022, 29 years to the date of Tang's murder. Hoffman Ramos was charged with murder in the death of Xu Ming Tang. Sheriff's Lieutenant Jacob Trickett said that the purpose of a cold case unit was to have a fresh perspective and to utilize more updated information management systems. That's basically one of the reasons we were led back to Rain, he said. In July 1993, three months after the shooting, Tang's wife sold the store to another Taiwanese family. It had been a staple corner store for 87 years and remains open under new owner Chung Sun and his wife Ann Sun. Sun, who knows the family, said he still had questions about what took place. What happened 30 years ago? What did she do? He asked regarding the suspect. This gentleman never did a bad thing to any people, Sun told ABC7. San Carlos Mayor Sarah McDowell made a statement following the arrest of Huffman Ramos. Mr. Tang was a husband, a father, and a friend who came to the United States to provide a better life for his family. His death shook the community of San Carlos and has remained a topic of discussion over the years. The Tang family have not spoken publicly, but authorities have been keeping them updated on the case and its proceedings. Sheriff Carlos G. Bolanos thanked the Tang family for their support over the years. The San Mateo County Sheriff's Office would like to thank the Tang family for their support. I hope that your family will finally get the justice and closure that you deserve, 
he said to the Tangs. For 42 years, Irene Wilkowitz waited to discover the identity of her sister Eve's killer. It was four decades of constant fear, not knowing if she too would be the victim of a murder. Eve Wilkowitz was a 20-year-old woman living in Bayshore, New York. She was working as a secretary at a publishing house. She was reported missing after failing to return home from a night out. Her body was found in a yard mere blocks from her apartment. She was kidnapped, raped, and strangled to death after taking a late-night train back from Manhattan. For Eve's sister Irene, the case haunted her for her entire life. She was just 17 years old when police arrived at their family home to deliver the devastating news. Irene never gave up the fight to find who killed her sister. She wasn't famous. She wasn't a celebrity. She was my sister, and she matters, said Irene. Eve was born on April 17, 1959. A Long Island native, Eve grew up in Oakdale, New York. After her mother's passing from cancer in 1977, she soon moved out of the family home and into her own apartment. Here she lived with a roommate, Robert Grogan, for two years. Friends described her as vibrant, with a heart as big as her dreams. She was working for a popular publishing house in Manhattan and frequently commuted by train. It took her two trips of an hour and 45 minutes each to get to work and return home daily. In 1980, though, Grogan remembered Eve mentioning a feeling of uneasiness. She told him about a couple of men that would follow her from the train station. One man had been pestering her to go out for a date, which she declined. A second followed her for the entire 10-minute walk back to their shared apartment. These pests eventually fell away and Eve went on to meet a young writer named Jack Dempsey. On March 21, 1980, Jack and Eve spent the evening together in the city. They watched a movie and had dinner before going back to his apartment. Before falling asleep, she asked Jack to wake her up in time to catch the 12.45 a.m. train back to Long Island. The morning of March 22, 1980, Jack walked Eve to the train station. He'd offered to take the train with her, but she waved him off, telling him she'd be fine. He watched her board the Long Island Railroad train. He never saw Eve alive again. By 7 a.m. that morning, her roommate Robert noticed Eve did not return home. He hadn't initially reported anything until the evening, when no one could make contact with her. Together with family and friends, calls were made to local hospitals asking if they'd admitted anyone fitting Eve's description. There was no sighting of Eve anywhere, and panic began to settle in. A woman living just three blocks from Eve's apartment made a gruesome discovery in her neighbor's yard on the morning of March 25, 1980. Eve's lifeless body was found on the lawn of another neighbor. She was wearing blue jeans and a blouse. Her shoes and socks were missing. Police were called to the scene and soon discovered rope marks on her wrists, suggesting she'd been bound at some point. Police speculated she may have been held captive and sexually assaulted before being strangled to death and dumped just blocks from her apartment. When Eve's family were informed of her untimely passing, the trauma of her violent end would go on to haunt her sister Irene for the next 42 years. Investigations began, but leads were far and few. Suspects were interviewed and evidence collected, but nothing came from the case and it went cold. Police even looked into Jack, the last person to see Eve alive. Jack was called out to Long Island. Police were keeping him as a person of interest in the case, seeing as they'd spent the last night together since she went missing. Jack understood the process and cooperated with officials. Fortunately for him, a medical student from whom he'd bought a stereo showed up to deliver the package along with his father. Both men were able to provide an alibi for Jack's whereabouts on Saturday morning. He also had to undergo a lie detector test to prove his innocence. In the 90s, though, two detectives showed up at his home and spoke to him before getting a DNA swab as part of evidence for future testing. All the while, the terror of being the next target remained with Irene. She worked as a nanny and shared an apartment with her son. This was in part due to her fear of living alone. For years, Irene became the advocate in finding Eve's killer. Being the only sibling, Irene had no one but her father to turn to when in doubt. Unfortunately, he too passed away in 2010 before knowing who was responsible. Irene kept the memory of Eve alive by giving interviews to local newspapers each year on the anniversary of Eve's murder. She went on to study, work, and marry. 
She raised two children and divorced before moving away from Long Island, living with the fear of being the target of a killer. Her pursuit for justice had her keeping up with detectives every few weeks, following up with leads and being active in the case. Although police were trying, DNA testing had not yet progressed to an advanced stage. Then in 2018, Irene's son told her about the genetic genealogy testing used to identify the Golden State Killer. There was renewed hope. In January 2019, Irene contacted famous genealogist Cece Moore. However, Moore said that she could not get involved, as New York didn't yet allow the technique to be used in a criminal investigation. New York was one of the states hesitant to use the technology, as privacy advocates feared the government's misuse of people's personal data. It was going to be a rigorous process, one that would take months or years. The State Department of Health required a private lab to obtain a permit, which at the time was not being granted in the case. Irene pleaded with Suffolk County Police Lieutenant Kevin Bayer, who was a homicide investigator and oversaw Eve's case to find a way. Bayer too was frustrated by the circumstances, but by December 2019, Suffolk County authorities found a loophole. Since the FBI helped with the original investigation, they were not restricted to New York laws. The semen sample lifted from Eve's body was sent to their labs with permission from the New York Department of Health. Agreeing to this, the FBI began the process of testing, and in July 2021, one of the agents specializing in genetic genealogy told investigators she'd found a distant relative of the unknown suspect, the common surname being Rice. Working with the information they had and several background checks, they found a direct name, Herbert Rice. Herbert, though, had been long dead by the time. He succumbed to cancer in 1991. Looking back into the original investigation, Rice was not considered a suspect despite a sweeping investigation of the area. He did have a few records of arrests for nonviolent crimes, but none that required he submit a DNA sample. At the time of the murder, Herbert was living with his mother after his then-wife kicked him out of their home. His mother's residence was just four houses away from the crime scene. Records showed that Rice's mother was questioned following the murder, but she said she didn't notice anything unusual during the time. Suffolk County Police Detective Jerry Batari had a possible name and now he needed DNA confirmation before he could break the news to Irene. Detectives tracked down family members of Rice and came upon one of his sons. Failing to obtain a covert sample, Batari just walked up to the son's door and knocked. Hesitant at first, Rice's son eventually allowed Batari and his team to take a DNA swab. Once detectives explained their purpose for the visit, he explained that he had not shared a close relationship with his father. Rice's son and ex-wife filled much of the missing details surrounding the mystery. Although he was not responsible for Eve's murder, Rice's son still wished he could apologize for the actions of his father to the Wilkowitz family. In August 2021, the DNA sample proved that Rice was the killer, as his son's DNA sample provided the missing familial link. Batari, accompanied by other detectives, knocked on the door of Irene Wilkowitz and gave her the news that she'd been long waiting to hear. Irene admitted to expecting the worst, that detectives would tell her that they had hit a dead end. Falling into the arms of her son Evan, whom she'd named in memory of Eve, the nightmare that long haunted her waking hours came to an end. For 42 years, this is all I wanted. I just wanted it to be over. My goal was to be a mom. And beyond that, I didn't allow myself to dream any other dream because I was afraid someone would come along and murder me, she said. They explained to Eve the process of finding Herbert Rice. And after the meeting, Irene said she was open to talking to Rice's son. He too told detectives he would consider the option. Irene thanked all investigators for their outstanding dedication to the case and in solving Eve's murder. I just want to say thank you, said Irene, and how sorry I feel for him and his family to know that a family member is responsible for a crime like this, and they have to live knowing that. It's horrible for them as well. Before announcing the case being solved, investigators obtained a search warrant to exhume Rice's body. The results of testing came back positive on March 23, 2022, nearly 42 days to the date of Eve's kidnapping. 
Suffolk County Police Commissioner Richard Harrison praised genetic genealogy for the ability to help them find the killer. Bayer praised Irene for her enduring faith in finding Eve's killer. He said she was the real star of the case. In the years that passed, Jack Dempsey wrote on a blog about the feelings that consumed him following Eve's brutal murder. He writes about the impact her death had on his emotions and the periods of heartache. He likens her loss to a cosmic iron wall that he needed to climb to find release. At the end, though, he thanked her for the inspiration she gave him and the guidance she still provides as he makes his way up into the world of writing. In his blog, Dempsey encapsulates the emotions felt by all those who had the privilege of knowing Eve and now feeling the void of her loss. For Irene, though, there will always be unanswered questions. I can't ask him anything. Why did he do it? There are no real answers. No reason why, she said. Irene wants her sister to be remembered not just as a story being retold to the media. She was a real person, and she'd like to be a big sister to me. I want people to know that, she said. Super Bowl Sunday, 1989. While America celebrated the San Francisco 49ers winning over the Cincinnati Bengals, the Rogers family suffered in silence without any word from their beloved sister and daughter, Cynthia. Cynthia Rogers was a 27-year-old biologist working on Parkinson's disease research at the National Institute of Health. She was living alone in an apartment complex in the Forestville area of Prince George County. Her family last heard from her on the morning of January 22, 1989. According to her family, she planned on doing some grocery shopping. She'd been on her way to the local store, along the familiar tree-lined path used by locals. Unknown to Cynthia, Eva lurked among the trees waiting for an opportunity to strike. For five days, Cynthia's continued silence fueled her family to begin a search for her that would end in tragedy. Her body was discovered on January 27, 1989, dumped alongside a dirt path strewn with litter in a wooded area of Forestville. Detective Bernie Nelson described the attack as extremely vicious. Cynthia suffered multiple blunt force injuries to her head and upper body. She was sexually assaulted and eventually strangled to death. Described as a free spirit and someone who loved watching birds and taking long walks, Cynthia's death left a void in the lives of her loved ones. For her mother, Rosia Rogers, there was no healing. It's just a big hole, you know, she told Fox 5 during an interview in 2001. It's just a big old hole, you know. By then, it had already been 12 years since Cynthia's murder, and investigations had hit a stumbling block. Although DNA evidence collected at the scene was used to rule out possible suspects, the sample was still not strong enough to enter into the FBI database. The profile that the FBI was able to develop from the sample wasn't strong enough to meet the standards entered into the database. But it is something we can work with, given the name of someone we can approach and obtain their DNA and compare it directly to the sample said Nelson. But there was no name. No suspects ever appeared on the radar in connection to Cynthia's murder. However, on January 24, 2022, the case was revived by investigators, not without the help of Cynthia's cousin, Dawn. She'd been working tirelessly to find new methods of technology that could help detectives solve the case that had haunted their family for far too long. She spent years probing detectives and inquiring about DNA advancements until she finally had her voice heard. I've been making any efforts I could to keep this case in the forefront. It's a glimmer of hope in general that my efforts were not in vain, said Dawn. New technology meant DNA could be retested using newer methods of analysis. Investigators found their suspect, James Clinton Cole, a 64-year-old convict already serving a life sentence. Cole's records painted a picture of a dark criminal past. He was charged with a misdemeanor assault in 1984, a destruction of property charge just days before Cynthia's murder, and a charge of child abuse in 1995. In 2009, the long arm of the law finally caught up to Cole when his DNA matched to a rape investigation back in 1996. The girl had been walking behind Benjamin Stoddard Middle School when she was accosted by the suspect at knife point. He then forced her into the wooded area where he proceeded to rape her. Before fleeing, he tied her hands and feet with scraps of material. 
she was able to free herself and sought help at a nearby residence. Police questioned the girl, who described her attacker as a medium-complexion black man. He had short hair, was six feet tall, and was wearing a black and white striped shirt. The similarities between the crime scenes provided police with an understanding of how Cole planned his attacks. He was an opportunistic criminal. He was arrested and charged for the rape of the 12-year-old girl that occurred on the 20th of August, 1996. He received two life sentences and, during his imprisonment, was linked to the murder of Cynthia through advanced DNA testing. He's currently serving a sentence at the Western Correctional Institution in Cumberland, Maryland. Cole was charged with first-degree murder, first-degree rape, and several other offenses against Cynthia. It's unclear when he'll appear in court, but Cynthia's family want to be there when it does happen. For her mother, Rosia, the news has made things lighter. It makes us feel better. In my heart, I feel lighter, she said. But she wants her moment with her daughter's killer. I really want to see this person who did this face-to-face, -face, says Rosia. For Cynthia's brother, Philip Rogers, the burden has been lifted to a certain point. There will never be a full recovery because of the incident, but we have had some relief, he stated. Investigators do not believe Cynthia and Cole knew each other. They've concluded that Cole may have seen a young, petite woman who proved to be an easy target for his sinister intentions. For three decades, the mystery of Nona Stamey Cobb's murder eluded investigators. Nona's body was found along I-77 on the northbound side in Surrey County on July 7, 1992, in the early morning. A female witness who remained anonymous last saw her getting into a truck on the night of July 6, 1992, at the Welcome Center on Interstate 55 in Cleveland County. The truck was being driven by an unidentified white male. Nona was a 29-year-old widow with a 3-year-old son named Josh. She spiraled into drug addiction and, seven months before her murder, had lost custody of Josh. Her sister, Vicky S. Gregory, was raising the boy together with her husband. Vicky, though, maintained that Nona was a loving mother who loved her son and family deeply. She loved us and we loved her. Just because you do something wrong doesn't mean you stop loving her, she said. Nona was found strangled to death by a passing driver on the highway with very little evidence apart from DNA on her clothing and semen on her body. There were no suspects police could pinpoint at the time. Then, in April 1995, three years after Nona's murder, interest was revived following the confession of a known serial killer. Sean Patrick Goebel came forward and confessed to the murders of three women. Goebel allegedly targeted sex workers and transported them across states before dumping their bodies along interstates. He confessed to the murders of Brenda K. Hagee, aged 45, Sherry Tu Mansour, age 34, and Rebecca Haynes, age 36. His modus operandi seemed to match that of Nona's murder. However, DNA testing cleared Goebel as a suspect in Nona's murder after the semen sample did not match with Goebel's DNA profile. Investigators were back to square one. It wasn't until April 2021 that new technology would help solve the decades-old mystery. The North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation Surrey County Sheriff's Office, and Identifinders International collaborated to catch a killer. Using the latest method in DNA testing and genetic genealogy, investigators, together with Dr. Colleen Fitzpatrick, president and founders of Identifinders International, identified 71-year-old Warren Luthen Alexander. By using DNA submitted from family members, investigators were able to narrow down the suspect list and identify Alexander through the DNA evidence collected at the crime scene. Alexander was arrested at his home in Diamond Head, Mississippi on March 15, 2022, and held at the Hancock County Jail. He was extradited back to North Carolina on March 27, 2022, and has been jailed without bond. He was charged with the murder and the death of Nona Stamey Cobb. The investigation is ongoing, as many other homicides along the interstate remain unsolved. Police have not directly linked Alexander to other cases as of yet. Sheriff Steve Hyatt gave due credit to the investigators who worked on the case since 1992, stating that the groundwork done by the original investigative team allowed them to find Nona's killer 30 years later through proper evidence preservation. SBI Director Robert Shermeyer had some strong words for criminals. I want to send a clear message here. 
Hear my words. The men and women of the SBI, in partnerships with sheriff's offices across the state and around the country, will seek out justice for the cold cases that we have in our books. We will work day and night to pursue the suspects who think they may have gotten away with it 20, 30, 40 years ago, he said. I will tell you, genetic genealogy is a game changer, said Shermeyer. When investigators solved Diane Don's murder 34 years later, her son Mark Bayer, now 36 years old, was blown away by how the killing was solved. The only evidence ever recorded were fingernail scrapings and a hair from Diane's hands. Diane Lynn Dawn was a 29-year-old mother of one. She was the first female radio repair technician at the San Diego Transit Company. Friends described her as a free spirit with a wicked sense of humor. She loved to draw and was a talented violinist. Diane also had a love for stock car racing and was often down at the El Cayon Speedway watching races. When Diane failed to show up for work on May 2, 1998, co-workers found this behavior out of character. Concern prompted one of them to drop by her Santee apartment to check up on her. What she found was horrifying. Diane's nude body lay in her bed. She'd been stabbed multiple times and bludgeoned to death. Her then two-year-old son Mark was wandering around the apartment complex unsupervised. Police were called and investigations began. But the leads dried up quickly. Digging into Diane's past, there seemed to be no enemies, no vindictive exes or spouses, no spurned lovers, no motive for life insurance claims. It was not a case of sexual assault or robbery. The killer was a phantom. Despite questioning the maintenance man, there were no new leads and the case grew cold. Mark was adopted and raised by Diane's close friends, but often visited with her family in order to keep the memory of his mother alive. In an interview, Mark Byer said that although he did have his family, there is a sense of loneliness knowing you've lost your mother. Looking back at some of the struggles that you go through, you kind of feel alone because of what you went through, he said. In the years 2000 and 2001, with technology progressing, investigators tried once more to test the DNA found at the crime scene. Putting it through a federal DNA database from unsolved crimes yielded no results. The sample was not strong enough. In 2010, a cold case team took another crack at the case. This time, they scoured the evidence looking for clues that may have been overlooked. The hair found in Diane's hands was matched to the DNA scrapings taken from underneath her nails. It was a match, proving Diane fought back. The sample was put through CODIS this time. However, no matches were made. This meant Diane's killer didn't commit other serious crimes or was smooth enough not to be caught. Then in 2020, the cold case team joined forces with the crime lab and utilized the new technology known as genetic genealogy. By tracing genetic profiles of family members to DNA found at unsolved crime scenes, suspects who would have gotten away with crimes were able to be traced. The Sheriff's Department released a statement with regard to the methods they used to track Diane's killer. They said that it was important to know that genetic genealogy was a last resort in solving homicide cases. Over the years, all avenues had been exhausted. It was most likely the case would have gone unsolved had it not been for the new technology. Using the single strand of hair and samples of DNA scrapings, Investigators were able to match the DNA to possible relatives on the genealogy database. It was an exhaustive task, but pure determination brought with it results. Investigators and genealogists poured over 1,300 DNA samples of possible relatives and created nine family trees before a single common name popped up, Warren Robertson. Robertson was never on the radar as a suspect in the case. He was a local tow truck driver who also lived in the same apartment complex as Diane. He too was known to enjoy stock car racing and did visit the El Cayon Speedway on occasion. However, investigators found no link between the two and could not determine if they'd known each other. Robertson was born in Arkansas but spent the major part of his life in San Diego. After the murder, he moved to Lakeside, leaving his family behind. He eventually moved to Indiana in 1989. Robert, it seemed, had no criminal past, his most serious offense being the murder of Diane. Unfortunately for the family of Diane, justice was not to be served. 
Robertson died 21 years prior to the discovery of Diane's murderer. He was killed during a house fire in Indiana in November 1999, aged 39. For Diane's family, getting the answer to the who brought with it a sense of relief. Meyer remains satisfied with the outcome, even though the killer will not see justice served. The answers that my family received is closure, and closure is everything, even after so much time has passed, he said. Meyer went on to say that he heard many good things about his mother from friends and family. She was a good person. Everything I've ever been told and heard about her is that she was a good person, and I like to think that those values have transferred off to me, and I do my best to be a good person. The world could always use more good people, he said. Diane's younger sister, Victoria Dan Minter, said she was grateful to investigators who helped solve the case. I don't think anything was ever going to come of this. I thought I myself was going to go to my grave not knowing, as well as my mother and father, she said. When they came back and said they got a hit, it probably was, other than the birth of my children, the best day of my life. She can now rest in peace. At least there's an answer. But it doesn't make the pain any better, said Victoria. The sheriff's office said in a statement, this murder would likely have gone unsolved if not for the use of investigative genetic genealogy. On August 25, 1995, a passerby discovered the remains of a woman in a sleeping bag along Pine Hill Road in Kitsap County. When police responded, they discovered the woman was naked and suffered two gunshot wounds to the head. She was later identified through her fingerprints as Patricia Lorraine Barnes, a 61-year-old native of Seattle, Barnes was a somewhat well-recognized figure. People called her the Towel Lady, as she was often seen wearing a towel or bandana wrapped around her head. She was homeless and bounced between homeless shelters in Seattle. She was also known to frequent the Pioneer Square area. Police ruled their death a homicide and collected over 130 items of evidence from the crime scene. In an attempt to find leads, Police canvassed the area and witnesses came forward with information regarding Barnes's whereabouts prior to the discovery. Some alleged to have seen her with a white male aged 30 to 35 years old. The pair allegedly told another man they planned to eat at Courthouse Park before making their way to Federal Way. It was the first time they saw this man with her. No one saw Barnes again until her body was discovered dumped on the roadside. A composite sketch was drawn up but no leads came from the picture after it was circulated. Police also believe Barnes may have been the victim of Robert Lee Yates, known as the Spokane serial killer, a murderer who had shot his victims before dumping their bodies in remote locations. Barnes did not exactly fit the profile of Yates's victims, but the similarities in the murder were striking. He was, however, ruled out when police discovered he was stationed in Alabama during the time of Barnes's murder. The case went cold. In 2018, a renewed interest developed in solving cold cases following the use of genetic genealogy to track killers who had previously gone undetected. Barnes's case was reopened in 2018 as part of a division-wide focus on past cold cases. Given the amount of physical evidence, investigators began looking through the pieces of the puzzle that was the Barnes murder. They re-interviewed past detectives and began exploring new DNA testing tools that had become available. This time around, Yates was excluded from the investigation as a thorough review of his movements placed him out of town during the time of Barnes' murder. In August 2020, acting on earlier information, a search warrant for DNA was executed in Houston, Texas with the assistance of the Harris County District Attorney's Office. Investigators followed up on a lead regarding a person of interest who was believed to be the last person to see Barnes alive. The DNA sample taken from the person did not match what was recovered from Barnes or the crime scene. Investigators pushed for further testing and discovered that a single unidentified male DNA profile was found on three separate evidence sources at the crime scene. The DNA was found on Barnes's body and matched that of a cigarette butt that was discarded near her body. After putting the profile into CODIS, there was still no match. Whoever had killed Barnes was not entered into the national database. With leads now exhausted despite the technology, KCSO partnered with Othram Labs. They were able to create a genealogical profile, and Othram Labs worked hard to narrow down to a specific person. 
There was a lead found in December 2021. Acting on the information, KCSO investigators followed the lead down to Nogales, Arizona. With assistance from the Arizona Police Department, they tracked down the identified suspect, Douglas Keith Crone. Crone was a career criminal. He had five felony convictions to his name, according to records in Washington. This included a conviction for first-degree robbery in 1984. He was also arrested in Pierce County in 1994 for kidnapping in the second degree. For some reason, though, his DNA was not entered into any criminal database. In an ironic twist of fate, Crone was already dead. He had allegedly been electrocuted while installing a television antennae that hit a nearby power line in September 2016. It was his death, however, that helped investigators in identifying his connection to the DNA. With help from the Arizona Police Department and Pima County Medical Examiner's Office, biological material taken from Crone's postmortem was allowed to be used to match the DNA profile developed by investigators. In January 2022, Washington State Patrol Crime Lab concluded the biological material from Crone's postmortem matched the DNA extracted from Barnes's crime scene and the discarded cigarette butt. Kitsap County Sheriff's Office Detective Mike Grant called the cigarette butt the linchpin that blew the case open. The evidence on the body could mean one of two or three different things, but when you have a cigarette butt with the DNA and the DNA on her body and on items around her body, it was conclusive to me that we had the right guy, he said. Detectives also realized the initial composite sketch bared a striking resemblance to Crone, who would have been around 33 years old at the time of the murder. Grant reached out to the family of Barnes, who were described as being shocked and grateful that they have answers now after nearly 30 years of uncertainty. Technology, a marvel of the modern era. Like all things, they're the good and bad that come with the advancement. In the technological age, mankind faces the dilemma of privacy infringement. Every step taken is recorded and stored away in cloud systems around the world. In the case of Alison Sutherland Crane, technology proved to be the key to finding her killer. Jeffrey Ray Phillips, a man already charged with the murder of his roommate Timothy France back in 2017, was linked through cell phone records in the murder of Allison. Allison was just 24 years old when a married couple stumbled across her nude body while out looking for wildlife on the evening of August 7, 2009. She'd been dumped under a bridge near Lakeside Hill in Greenville, South Carolina. The young mother of two suffered multiple blunt force trauma injuries, which led to her untimely death. There was no murder weapon found at the scene, nor any clues to identify the killer. For 13 years, her case went cold. Her family, though, never gave up and never forgot about her. Allison was loved by so many people. She was loved by her daughters, her sister, me, other family members, her uncle Stevie, and a lot of people that's not here that's passed on since this, said her mother, Tammy Morrison. 38-year-old Jeffrey Ray Phillips stands accused of murdering the young woman after cell phone records showed he'd been present in the vicinity during the time of Allison's murder. Digging deeper, investigators found a strong link between Phillips and Allison. At the time, Phillips was a cab driver, and Allison frequently used his services to get around. Police records show that Allison was frustrated with Phillips as he allegedly owed her money. Phillips' cell phone logs were discovered during an investigation into a completely unrelated crime. He had already been charged with murder in another incident back in August 2017. The body of 28-year-old Timothy France was found in the woods behind a mobile home. He shared this home with Phillips back in 2017. After reports of a prowler being sighted near the mobile home park were made to police, Bluff City police officers responded to the area. They discovered the body of France. He suffered severe blunt force trauma to the head and had two wounds on his back one of which appeared to be a knife wound. When police arrived at the crime scene, Phillips allegedly walked out of the trailer using only a bath towel. When questioned, he denied knowing France or having any knowledge of what had happened. Phillips then told investigators he needed to get ready for work. Shortly afterward, he stepped out dressed to go when investigators noticed blood on his shoes and scratch marks on his hands. Phillips allowed police to search the home where they eventually found a bloody shirt and traces of blood in the bathroom. 
he was arrested the very next day. Although he initially claimed no knowledge, under interrogation, Phillips presented officers with a new version of events. Phillips alleged that he was angry with France for selling meth to his, Phillips's, girlfriend. He lured France out of the home under the guise of taking down a hammock. In this version, Phillips claims to have been so enraged he blacked out and could not remember the events that followed. Authorities, however, allege that Phillips bludgeoned France to death using a rock, garden hoe, and bathroom pedestal. He then tied the victim's legs together with a towel and dragged him into the wooded area behind the mobile home. Police referred to it as a botched cover-up. Phillips was charged with Timothy France's murder and is serving his time in Sullivan County Jail in Tennessee without bond awaiting trial. Greenville County Sheriff Hobart Lewis said the arrest of Phillips for Allison's murder marks their fifth cold case solved since the unit commenced in August 2020. He said he was blessed to work alongside such dedicated investigators. This is a prime example of the vision we had for the unit coming to life, to bring resolve and justice for the family and friends who have tragically lost their loved one, he said. Lewis explained how it was already hard on families to lose loved ones, and how it was harder still to have unanswered questions when cases go cold. We have so much more work to do, but this is another tremendous step in our agency's pursuit of unwavering commitment to solving cold case homicides, said Lewis. For Allison's family, there's a sense of relief. They said that for the first time in 12 and a half years, they were able to wake up without wondering who killed Allison. It felt good. You don't have to go in stores and wonder if you're standing by someone that did this, said Allison's mother, Tammy. Tammy urged those who are still waiting for answers to keep pursuing justice. You keep on. And if it takes 50 calls a day to Greenville County or any other county, then that's what you do. You don't give up, she said. In January 1999, police responded to calls from a neighbor reporting screaming from a residence in the 1300 block of Carlson Boulevard. The screaming reportedly lasted over 30 seconds before all went silent. At first he tried to go around and check on this neighbor himself, but thought twice and called 911 instead. When police arrived, they found the front door locked. The back door, though, was left ajar. Inside, officers discovered the body of Mikia Wadley on her bedroom floor. She was dead, but her body was still warm to the touch. Her hands were bound with shoelaces, and she'd been raped before being smothered to death. A buck knife was found underneath her body. At just 28 years old, Mikia's young life was snatched away brutally. She left behind an 18-month-old daughter and scores of family members who remember her fondly and never stopped chasing the truth. Her sister, Kelia Wadley, described her as an outgoing person, always smiling and making friends. She had the same group of friends since elementary school, the same group of friends now. Just a sweet person, she said. Mikia's niece, Devine Peterson, said her aunt was someone people always loved having around and hanging around. My favorite auntie. She was beautiful, outgoing, and smart. She loved hanging out and having fun, she said. Police began an intensive investigation. Initially, investigators focused on a man she'd spent time with the previous evening. Other than him, there were no other leads. He, however, was ultimately ruled out as a suspect. The case grew cold as the only person of interest was ruled out. For the next 20 years, though, police continued to follow up on the case by testing the DNA found under Mikia's fingernails and a bloodstain found in the bedroom. In 2002, a mixed DNA profile was created from the swabs collected from Mikia's hands and the bloodstain. The profile was submitted to the Department of Justice to search their offender database. This yielded no results. 18 years later, in 2020, additional DNA testing was done, this time focusing on previously untested fingernail clippings and ligatures. This provided authorities with a male DNA profile. In October of the same year, the DNA profile created by the Contra Costa County Crime Lab was submitted to the DOJ's DNA databank program. This was done to conduct a familial search of the state's DNA index system. In April 2021, the DOJ's investigation revealed a person who was potentially a first-degree relative of the suspected perpetrator. The relative, though, was ruled out as a suspect. Police, however, had a suspect name, 
but were keeping the revelation quiet until they could find a confirmed sample. It was going to be difficult because the suspect was already dead. Detectives were able to track down an immediate relative of the suspect in September 2021. A buccal swab was obtained and submitted to the crime lab for testing. That same month, investigators received the confirmation they needed. Mikia's killer was identified as 35-year-old Jerry Lee Henderson. Henderson was someone who was known to Mikia. They shared a mutual friend and often stayed over at the same friend's house. But Henderson had overstayed his welcome. When the mutual friend refused to house Henderson any longer, he instead went to bunk at Mikia's home, not expecting her to return home. Police believe this is when he attacked Mikia and fled the scene after the crime. Whispers abounded and rumors spread with regard to the nature of the crime. Mikia's sister Keila cleared up the confusion surrounding the murder of her sister. Many people labeled the murder as a domestic violence dispute. She refuted the claims, stating that Henderson and her sister were just friends who went to the same college. There had never been a romantic relationship between the two. So he was a friend of her friend Terry, and they both knew him. At a press conference on April 21, 2022, police revealed that the suspect was identified, but had died 11 days after murdering Nikia from an apparent drug overdose. Acting Richmond Police Chief Louis Tirona withheld the name. So we're 100% confident that he is, he is the murderer. I don't want to give him any honor by mentioning who that might be. Who wore shirts printed with her photo to show their undying support, to stand up and be heard. Mikia's niece, Devonay, raised her hand to get Tarina's attention. Why is it okay that he's a secret? We know what he did. Why can't the family know? They look at him as a hero. He's not a hero. He's a murderer, she said. We know what he did. Why the mm -hmm. family can't know? They look at him as a hero. He's not a hero. He's a murderer. Tarina responded by asking her, why give someone fame and notoriety for a murder? Why give somebody fame and notoriety for Let committing such a murder? Attendees at the press conference supported the family's request, demanding that authorities give them the closure they deserved. Bowing to pressure from the crowd, Torina finally named Henderson as a suspect in Mikia's murder. After the press conference, Mikia's sister, Keila Wadley, spoke to Oxygen.com to iron out a few details. She said the press conference didn't do the story justice, and it felt hurtful and humiliating. She told the news outlet that Mikia actually made it to the hospital, that she herself saw the staff working on her. The identification of Henderson, though, had brought some sense of closure to the family, and their justice was served. Keela stated that Mikia fought back, and that was what ultimately helped investigators find and recover the DNA needed to find Henderson. Mikia would have turned 50 this year and been a proud grandmother. Her daughter is now a mother herself, said Keela. When given the opportunity to speak at the press conference, Keela simply said that the time of seeking answers for deaths of family members needed to stop. Those communities needed to end the senseless violence. In a statement released by California Attorney General Rob Bonta, he said that it was his sincere hope that this resolution brings the family of Mikia Wadley a measure of peace. Bonta reiterated that no stone will remain unturned to secure justice and find the truth. Nothing can ever bring back a loved one, but we're committed to doing all that we can to help bring the truth to light in the fight for justice, he said. Get to the hospital. These were the words uttered in a phone call made by the younger brother of Kevin Drinks. The family rushed to the hospital assuming Kevin was involved in an accident, only to discover he'd been killed in a shooting. Those four words continued to haunt Kenya Drinks for 10 years until the men responsible for killing her husband Kevin were finally brought to justice. Kevin, who was 50 years old, was gunned down on December 10, 2011. He was parked behind underground market furniture in North Philadelphia. He had just started work four days prior as a delivery driver. He was shot three times just after 6.30 p.m. and was rushed to hospital where he died shortly after arriving. For the family, it was a puzzling situation. Anyone who knew Kevin knew he was a doting grandfather who regularly went to church and sang gospel songs. To him, family was everything. For Kenya, though, she had lost the love of her life. Kevin and Kenya met back in 1978, 
high school sweethearts who attended their Germanstown High School prom together. However, they broke up after graduation. Two decades later, they reconnected after Kenya's mother passed away in the year 2000. Kevin stopped by to pay his respects. The rest was history. Kevin was a divorcee, but that didn't stop Kenya from making the best of this second chance. The two married in 2001, with Kevin serenading Kenya as she walked down the aisle. Ten years later in 2011, they bought their dream home together in Ronhurst. For the next few months, they would spend time in their home, filling it with a shared love for each other. Kevin loved his family and enjoyed spending time with his three daughters and five grandchildren. Those were the last few months Kenya would share with her beloved husband. No one could foresee the call from Kevin's younger brother that was the end to the fairy tale she was building with Kevin. The only question on everyone's mind was, who would want to kill Kevin? Nothing panned out from the investigations made by police. People began to whisper that maybe there was something more to the killing. The home she built with Kevin became a shell of its former glory. But Kenya and Kevin's family didn't back down. She persisted with keeping up the investigation with police. T-shirts and buttons featuring Kevin's face were printed and distributed. Flyers were constantly circulated to ensure the memory of his case remained alive. The Justice for Kevin Drinks movement began. Kenya called upon elected officials to take action and shut down the whispers of Kevin being involved in underhand dealings. Frustration grew as other cases were being solved, but the Drinks family persisted in their unwavering belief that justice would be served. A month after Kevin's murder, Kenya called upon State Representative W. Curtis Thomas. There is a vigil and news conference organized by Thomas. We all must begin to take ownership and responsibility in our communities and stand up against the lawless element that's committed the crime. What happened to Kevin Drinks could happen to any of us, said Thomas. Thomas went on to implore community members to join in community policing. He said that everyone needed to come together in order to stop this senseless violence. Thomas called for the formation of a police substation along the busy corridor and an increase in bike patrols and beat cops. Captain Branville G. Bard agreed with Thomas and added to the sentiment felt by many present at the vigil. This is our community and we live here. We're imploring people to speak up, he said. He mentioned that every day that passes and Kevin's murderer goes without being caught showed that people just didn't care. The vigil fed a fire in Kenya until time started to get the best of her and her faith in justice. Kenya prayed. She eventually moved away from the painful memories and also out of fear for her safety. Over time, though, her faith began to dwindle. Kenya understood the police were overwhelmed, but sometimes wondered if Kevin's case was even being worked on. But frustration grew. Kenya feared the case was going to grow ice cold. Slowly, she stopped calling the police as frequently as she used to. Kenya said her calls were often met with a patronizing attitude. She grew disappointed, questioning what was so hard in finding Kevin's killer. Her faith was further knocked when police were able to solve the killing of a fellow officer who was killed after Kevin. Killing an officer is the highest level of disrespect. I understand that. But if the department were willing to pull every stop to find someone who shot one of their own, why couldn't they do that for Kevin? she asked. Kenya became vocal about the lack of action in Kevin's case. I want justice for every murder victim in the city. If you take an oath to protect us, you should treat us the same as you would an officer, she said. She waited, biding her time as the case grew colder. Years passed with no new leads or feedback. And then there was a break in the case. In 2018, she got the call she'd been waiting for. It was a bittersweet moment when Kenya and her family discovered that Kevin was killed in a case of mistaken identity. Philadelphia police detective John Varecchio had been listening in on recordings of jailhouse conversations. They were investigating a different case through the coded conversations between prisoners when he stumbled across a conversation related to Kevin's case. Two months before Kevin was killed, Chad Rannells had been accused of murdering a 22-year-old man named Kristen Freeman. Rannells was worried about a witness that was going to testify against him, so he plotted with three other men, Michael Blackston, Samaj Armstead, and Rashawn Combs. The men were discussing the description of the witness, his workplace, and the kind of car he drove. 
they were formulating a plot to kill him and went through with it in December 2011. The witness they wanted to silence bore a striking resemblance to Kevin Drinks. They had killed the wrong man. The jailhouse conversation led to the convictions of the four men. In March 2022, all four men were found guilty of murder, conspiracy, and related charges in the death of Kevin Drinks. Reynolds, Blackston, and Armstead were found guilty in the first degree and sentenced to life imprisonment. Combs was given the lesser charge of third-degree murder. His sentencing was due to be heard on June 29th. It was later revealed that Michael Blackston was accused of killing five other people, with police saying the number qualified him as a serial killer. Following the sentencing, Kenya praised the work done by Assistant District Attorney Ashley Toksalowski and Christian Wynn. She also thanked witness victim coordinator Kathy Lees and called them her dream team. District Attorney Larry Krasner held a press conference in April 2022 near the place where Kevin was gunned down. Krasner told everyone present that Drinks was under surveillance for an entire day before he was killed in a case of mistaken identity. He then invited Kenya to speak. Though nervous at first, she took the stand and looked at the button that read, Justice for Kevin Drinks, the one she and her family and friends had worn for a decade. Then she spoke. Family, take the buttons off. Justice is done. Justice is served. We don't need those buttons anymore. For Kenya, her eyes have been opened to the number of families who, like her, still wait for answers surrounding the unsolved murders of their loved ones. One such person was a woman who stood by Kenya through the trial, Kathy Lees. Kathy confided to Kenya that her own son, Justin Rays, was gunned down just six months prior to Kevin's murder. The case remains unsolved, but by seeing Kenya's persistence and ultimate victory in getting the answer she needed, Kathy has hoped that she too would one day find the answers to her own son's murder. For three decades, the death of 22-year-old Susan Amy Morse baffled investigators. However, investigators now believe that they may have found the man responsible for the murder of Susan and a separate sexual assault that occurred in the same apartment complex a year later. When Susan failed to show up for work on August 16, 1989, her parents grew concerned. They requested police do a welfare check as Susan's absence was uncharacteristic behavior. Susan lived alone in the Mesa apartment. Police entered the apartment, which was eerily quiet, and made a gruesome discovery. Susan had been beaten and asphyxiated with an extension cord. The covers of her bed pulled up around her body. Police later discovered she had also been sexually assaulted. There were no leads, despite police canvassing the area and asking neighbors questions. No information surfaced, and the case was pushed to the back burner. A year later, in November 1990, another incident occurred at the same apartment complex. A 23-year-old woman called police to report a break-in. She told police that she awoke to a man holding a knife to her stomach. He told her that he was not going to hurt her, just rape her. The man reportedly crawled in through an open window. He sexually assaulted the woman, but left her alive. Her attacker then stole cash and a VCR before escaping. Following the second attack in the apartment complex, investigators looked back at evidence from both crime scenes and determined that the crimes were connected. There was no suspect in the case, though. For years, both cases sat cold at the Mesa Police Department. Susan's parents unfortunately passed away before they could get the answers they wanted. The technology of the time was not as advanced to determine the DNA profile of the suspect responsible for the murder and sexual assault cases. The break in the unsolved cases came in March 2022. Through genetic genealogy testing, DNA recovered from both crime scenes were used to develop a family tree for the suspect. The search was narrowed down until one name popped up, Thomas Cox. Mesa Police Department Sergeant Chuck Drapani said it was constant searching for newer advanced technology and testing DNA that helped with the solving of cases. In the case of Thomas Cox and Susan Morse, it worked out dramatically. Cox, who is 58 years old, was identified through familial markers. What cemented investigators' pursuit of him was the fact that Cox's mother lived next door to Susan at the time of her murder. In initial investigations, he'd never been considered a person of interest in either case. Police staked out Cox's Colorado Springs home and recovered a styrofoam cup, lid, and straw. 
The DNA lifted from the recovered items matched that of the DNA found at both crime scenes. Furthermore, a print lifted from a screen that had been removed from one of the victim's windows matched the prints of Cox. These were already in the system after he committed several misdemeanors in the 80s and 90s. Cox was linked to another attack of an unnamed victim around November 13, 1990. In March 2022, Cox was indicted following the 1989 killing of Susan and the sexual assault at the same apartment complex in November 1990. He was charged with a total of 16 counts in both cases that included first-degree murder, sexual assault, burglary, and kidnapping. On April 23, 2022, Cox was extradited from El Paso County to Maricopa County. He was held on a $1 million cash bond. The FBI in Phoenix, who also assisted with the case, released a statement that read, The passage of time does not deter law enforcement's persistence for truth and justice. Authorities were able to make contact with an aunt and cousin of Susan's who expressed their relief in having finally caught the man responsible for her death. On May 4, 2022, the Mesa Police Department released a statement from one of Cox's victims who wished to remain anonymous. In it, she said that she didn't believe this day would come. She was thankful for the work done by Detective Samuel and the Mesa Police Department. She also passed her deepest sympathies to the family of Susan Morse and said that, I didn't know Susan, but my fight became her fight. My pain became her pain, and my tears were her tears. She ended by saying that she learned how to stop being a victim and start being a survivor, despite what Thomas Cox took from her that night. For the criminals in these cases, it may have taken decades before they were captured and made to answer for their crimes. But the law never stops. Tell us what you think of the cases in the comments section below. If you haven't already, please subscribe, like, and hit the notification button. And if you haven't already heard, you can now enjoy your favorite crime documentaries in Spanish. Adios!